Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael Shuffler, Associate Dean for the Arts and the College of Arts and Letters uh, here at Notre Dame, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Ahead of the Game. Uh, this is our football season lecture series, which is sponsored by the college. Over the course of the season, um, the last few weeks, we've been hearing from faculty members from, uh, from across the college on a wide range of research interests, and we're delighted to have you here today. Uh, we hope to see some of you again on November 5th uh, for the next event. My colleague Mark Sanders from the Departments of English and Africana Studies uh, will introduce the Notre Dame Initiative on Race and Resilience, uh, for which he serves as director. Um, before moving on to the main event, I'd like to thank our colleagues in the Department of Music and Sacred Music uh, for allowing us to use this beautiful concert hall. I am especially grateful to Margaret Fassler, uh, to Peter Jeffrey, Janet Rudasix, uh, to Matt Haynes, and Daniel Stein. I'd also like to acknowledge our student assistants, uh, Emily Hannon and Chloe Leach, Senior Administrative Coordinator in the College of Arts and Letters, who worked with our speakers and the communications office and many others to make this series happen. So thank you very much. Our speaker today is Luis Fraga, the Joseph and Elizabeth Rami Professor of Political Science, uh, the Reverend Donald P. McNeil Professor of Transformative Latino Leadership and Director of the Institute for Latino Studies. Professor Fraga's professional achievements are are numerous, far too numerous um, to mention. Uh, it's thanks to his strong leadership that a whole array of institutions nationwide have grown and flourished. His publications, too, are numerous, and among them is a volume co-edited with Gabriel Sanchez and Ricardo Ramirez on Latinos and the 2016 election. That volume included his own essay, uh, entitled Latinos in National Politics 2016 and Beyond. He is currently at work on a book about the origins of the 1975 uh, Voting Rights Act, and that's the subject of his talk today. So please join me in welcoming Luis Braga. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for that very generous introduction. I'll be using some PowerPoint slides in the course of my talk with you today. And thanks so much for coming on a, taking time out of a, out of a day that is bright and sunny and cool and uh, you know just absolutely magnificent. But no, seriously, thank you very much for being here. I also want to thank, uh, besides um, Michael, I'd like to thank Dean Mustillo of the College of Arts and Letters for um, asking me to be one of the speakers in our ahead of the game series. This talk is based upon current research for a book that I'm doing on the impact of the origins and impact of the 1975 Voting Rights Act, as well as my recent testimony before the House Judiciary Committee, Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, which I gave in, I think it was the end of July, and perhaps most importantly, based upon my teaching, the first year seminar then entitled The Evolution of Voting Rights in the United States. So it's a very nice way for me to combine my research interests, my, if you will, public interest work, as well as the work that I do in the classroom with our Notre Dame students. Since the 1970s, since the 1970s, when I was in high school, uh, actually in high school. Um, that's a joke about age and so forth. When I was in high school, Latinos have been identified as the sleeping giant. Well, how has this evolved? And how can we understand this evolution through the lens of the Voting Rights Act and its various iterations and various transitions and especially the 1975 expansion and renewal? And in answering that question, what might we learn about how we can move forward 
in our understanding and integration of multiculturalism, multiracialism, uh, diversity, whatever term you're comfortable using, how can we move forward at the same time that our multiculturalism and multiracialism are moving forward in terms of demographics of the country, how can we use that as a way to also test whether or not our democracy is expanding at the same time and what the threats might be that still exist for democracy at the same time. So, what are my motivating questions for the talk? First, what is the history of voter suppression in the United States? I'll talk about what voter suppression is here in just a minute. How did this affect the language and policy action of the 1965 Voting Rights Act? Where I'll talk specifically about uh, the Section 5 preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act. I'm pretending to be a lawyer here um, and talking so much about um, legislation. Uh, but as an expert witness on a number of voting rights cases, I feel sometimes like I'm a lawyer. Ironically, in the course of the evolution of my career, I decided that I was not going to be a lawyer uh, and decided I would get a PhD in political science. And I think some of the most important work I've done has been in working as an expert witness, working with lawyers and trying to move forward. Now, as I'll say at the end of my talk, God has a plan, uh, whether we know it or not. Then what was the primary purpose and effect? As far as we can tell right now, that's part of the book of the 1975 Voting Rights Act that explicitly included a group called language minorities. But for most folks, and I think at the time, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about Latinos, although they were not the only group that was included under the term language minorities. And in fact, as again, God in his, her, its plan, um, happened to place together um, Michael McMullen, Michael Mullen. Michael Mullen, who's here on the front row, who was actually a legal counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee during the 1975 Voting Rights Act and hearings of the 1975 Voting Rights Act. And Michael and I had this magnificent one hour meeting yesterday. He was telling me, telling me about all of the ins and outs and intricacies of negotiation and so forth. And I recorded that conversation and I'm sure I'll record at least two others uh, to be able to get some further research and background. And Michael, thank you very much for sharing your experience and expertise with me. And then lastly, what does this history help us learn about the future of race, ethnicity and diversity and democracy in the United States? Now I'm gonna to have to be selective because we only have 40 minutes together which reminds me I should probably take my watch off. And as you also know, professors are um, wired to speak for a minimum of an hour and 15 minutes uh, for class time when we lecture. But I'm going to do it, I think, in 40 minutes. And there's someone in the back who is going to, <laughs> over here, who's going to go like this when we reach the 40 minute mark. So we have a chance for questions. So the first thing I want to talk about is the major periods of voter suppression in the United States. I'm gonna use this as a way that I organize my talk. I'm gonna talk about the Civil War and Reconstruction. We're gonna go through that quickly. And the period 1860 to 1877. And what's significant about this is that it's going to demonstrate the power of federal government enforcement in being able to expand voting rights to people who previously, in this case, who previously were slaves, and what happens when the federal government withdraws that support. Secondly, I'm going to talk again briefly about the era of Jim Crow, roughly uh, 1888 to um, 1965, when you had the, if you will, reimposition of strict codes and separation between African Americans and whites throughout mainly the South, but not exclusively the South, with regards to access to voter registration, access to voter participation, access to candidates running for office, and some of the things that we're, we're more familiar with, if you will. Then talk about, briefly again, about the Civil Rights Movement, 1940 to 1965, and then talk about the expansion and extension of the 1975 Voting Rights Act. So the Civil War and Reconstruction, 1860 to 77. Well, we're all familiar with the fact that in, um, oops, in um, 
the uh, Civil War era and especially the immediate post-Civil War era, we passed, that is the nation passed, three what are called the Civil War Amendments. 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 13th Amendment did what? This is the classroom part of um, my talk. What did the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution do? It eliminated slavery, thank you very much. The 14th Amendment? You have to speak loud. You have to speak loudly because I have hearing aids. Uh, okay, I didn't hear what you said. I'm sorry, but um, it it established uh, a due process and equal protection of the laws. And the reason the 14th Amendment was passed was because we weren't exactly sure as a nation, or at least this is very important, the radical Republican. God, can you imagine that? The radical Republican. It's a joke. You're supposed to laugh the radical Republican Party that was dominant in the House and the Senate at that time was concerned that although we had outlawed slavery, that it wasn't clear what the citizenship status would be of those who were former slaves. And the United States, as you know, has always been very comfortable having different categories of citizenship and who was eligible and who was not eligible and what citizenship meant meant different things for different segments of the population under law. And so a group of radical Republicans said, well, we need to make sure that freed slaves are citizens. And therefore, it defines in the 14th Amendment that a person is a citizen of the United States if they were born or naturalized in the United States. And that therefore, they were eligible for equal protection and due process, and that the federal government and no state could impose a law that would prevent them from equal access or equal protection of the laws. And this was designed, of course, to be focused on the southern states. Think of it as a precedent for the sort of focus that I'm going to talk about um, with regards to um, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And then the 15th Amendment did what? Voting right. It said that voting could not be restricted on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Now, this clearly was targeted at those who were freed slaves, recently freed slaves. It's been applied to other groups over the course of time. And we know that although one could be a citizen of the United States during this time, there was never any guarantee that that would allow you to vote. The largest group, about half of the population, who were citizens, who were not eligible to vote during this period of time, were women. White women, African American women, and others, questions with regards to freed blacks, particularly in northern states, as to whether they would be eligible to vote and what kind of uh, capacity they would have to vote, um, questions about Native Americans and whether or not they would be able to vote, even though they may be citizens of the United States. So the 15th Amendment was passed to be able to guarantee that those who were former slaves would have access to the ballot. Now, these are very dramatic pieces of legislation. But they're passed at a time when the representativeness of Congress was narrow. That is, it was dominated by radical Republicans, but Southern representation, Southern representation related to the Confederacy was quite limited. Not absent, but quite limited, so that the radical Republicans could dominate, if you will, the legislative process. Ironic, expansion of Democracy and access at a time when our representational system was less representative than it might otherwise be. Something to think about as we think about the contemporary circumstance. And among the ways in which the 13th, 14th, and especially 15th amendments to the Constitution were guaranteed was that the national government placed federal troops in southern states. So people were walking around with military uniforms and rifles to try to guarantee that people would be able to register, would be able to vote, would be able to run for office, and if there was any threat to that, then federal troops would intervene. It's estimated that at this time, approximately over 100,000 African Americans immediately registered to vote, whether they could read or not because of limited educational opportunity, whether or not they owned property or not, clearly most did not, whether or not they had been slaves for two years, five years, or several generations, 100,000 male African American former slaves registered to vote, a huge number 
especially in southern states where most African Americans were located. And there were approximately, something that I think we too often forget, there were approximately one, over 1,000 elect, African American elected officials, largely from southern states, elected largely by African American voters. Because African American voters, especially in rural areas of the South, were clearly the dominant population group, and therefore they voted together as a bloc and elected their first choice candidates to public office, and often those candidates, not exclusively, but often those candidates were African Americans themselves. This was a tremendous expansion in American democracy, rivaled only by the expansion that occurred about 40 years prior when the property requirement was removed for being able to vote for white male. But the Hayes-Tilden Compromise, everybody remember the Hayes-Tilden Compromise? The Hayes-Tilden Compromise between um, Rutherford B. Hayes and I believe it was John Tilden, uh, Hayes from Ohio, Tilden, uh, Hayes the Republican from Ohio, and Tilden the Democrat from New York, when they, in a very contested election, people made some reference to the Hayes-Tilden election uh, during the 2000 election, between uh, George W. Bush and Al Gore, um, when in a very contested election, the Democratic Party and Mr. Tilden, notice, Tilden was not from the South, he was from New York, agreed to allow the, sound familiar? The electors of the Republican Party, some question about which electors are seated now and who gets counted and so forth, allowed the Republicans to be seated rather than the Democrats so that Hayes would win the election on one primary condition. And that condition was the removal of federal troops. And in fact, the Republican Hayes agreed. When those troops were removed, we get to what we might call the era of Jim Crow, starting in roughly 1877 and going through 1965. But what's important to remember, and this is the reason I have this categorization, which comes from the work of my friend, um, historian at Caltech, J. Morgan Kauser, what's important to understand about this is that the removal of African Americans from registration rolls and the removal of African American elected officials didn't happen overnight. Troops out, whites get in and control government. It happened over the course of 20 to 30 years. It, it, was, it was gradual. Initially, there were attempts through organizations like the uh, Ku Klux Klan to use violence to prevent people from registering to vote, red, uh, prevent people from voting, and prevent people from running for office, African Americans that is. But soon afterwards, when whites began to be elected to city governments, county governments, state governments, and congressional seats, there were a series of practices, vote dilution practices, that were used, gerrymandering, at-large elections, limits to registration, making uh, um, official positions appointed rather than elected, and other efforts to not prevent blacks from voting, but to prevent blacks from casting a meaningful vote, to prevent blacks from being able to cast a vote that would have a high probability of leading their first choice candidate being elected into office. It was only with the re-imposition and imposition of these dilutionary practices that you could then get laws passed that we're much more familiar with that lead to voter disenfranchisement. You can't register and you can't vote by law. Not having registration offices open, uh, grandfather clauses, understanding clauses, uh, literacy tests, the sorts of things that we're more familiar with, I think, as um, scholars and students of, of American political development and American political history, and that many of you in the public are, uh, are more familiar with. But that took time to evolve. So this idea of evolution is also something that I want us to think about and understand. And it was only after those voter disenfranchisement mechanisms were enacted that you got in American politics, especially in the South, what uh, my friend J. Morgan Kauser calls lily white governance. That is, the writing in the early 19-teens, 1900s, 1920s, of new southern state constitutions where 
all of these disenfranchising laws and many of these dilutionary mechanisms were written in as part of the law to prevent blacks from registering, from voting, or, for, or, or from holding public office. So it's this gradual staged process, if you will, that ultimately led to what we know as the circumstance of Jim Crow. Well, that circumstance of Jim Crow, of course, what, what was, was what was challenged in the, the, the civil rights movement and, the voting, and what led to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now I'm gonna, um, focus my comments, because I want to get through these quickly, on just the voting aspects of the civil rights movement, which we know is a much broader movement regarding equality and treatment in schools and equality of treatment in, in public facilities and so forth. But in the area of voting, this was seen by leaders of the civil rights movement as the key, the key to being able to get back to what was there a number of decades ago, many decades ago, being able to freely register, vote, and have a chance of electing your first choice candidate to public office. Bloody Sunday, some of you may remember, was uh, when in 1965, there was a march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, there have been movies about this, there have been magnificent uh, historical accounts of this period of time when in Alabama, when a group of blacks decided that they were going to march from Selma to the state capitol in Montgomery to protest the fact that voter registration offices simply refused to be open to allow African Americans to register and vote. They were protesting that. When local sheriffs reacted very strongly, when there were policemen on horseback, when people were whipped, people were hit, uh, the famous congressman, John Lewis, uh, was, had his head split open and wasn't sure he was going to survive. And what's significant about Bloody Sunday was the way in which that event appeared on nationwide TV on Sunday night as, on Sunday afternoon, evening, as it was occurring. The nation, in other words, got to see how it was that a peaceful march, a peaceful protest, of African Americans, if you'll permit me, in their Sunday best, trying to march to have the chance to register to vote, were treated by Southern law enforcement officials. And that began to hit at the conscience of the nation. President Johnson decided to support the efforts to pass a Voting Rights Act in 1965. In doing this, and having President Johnson be such a leader in this, you know, President Johnson, actually a, a person that I've studied quite a bit, President Johnson was a master legislator. He knew how to get stuff done. He had been in the House, he had been in the Senate, he knew how to influence people, he especially knew how to threaten people who did not support him in his position. He used all of his influence to get the Voting Rights Act passed when he asked his staff to write the, I believe his words were, um, if I can remember my Texas accent, um, which I think I'm blessed not to have. But in any case, um, that's supposed to be a joke as well. The, the dang darnest, strongest Voting Rights Act that could ever be enacted. And um, he was able, through his influence and the influence of other members of, court, of, of members of the House and of the Senate, excuse me, to get a final vote of 333 to 85 in favor of the Voting Rights Act. Most of these 85 some Republicans around the nation, but primarily Democrats from the South, and a vote of 77 to 19 in the uh, Senate. Overwhelming, overwhelming majorities of both kids, bipartisan. And you could even say a higher percentage of Republicans supported this legislation than Democrats. Now what the Voting Rights Act did, and I don't have time to go into all of the elements of the Voting Rights Act, but what the Voting Rights Act did that was so significant are two specific articles. Section two, which set a national standard for voting, which said that no voting qualification or prerequisite to voting or standard practice or procedure shall be imposed or applied by any state or political subdivision in a manner that abridges or denies later change to which results and the denial or abridgment of the right of any citizen of the United States to vote on account of race or color or in contravention of the guarantees set forth in section 4F2 as provided in subsection B. 
only lawyers love language like that at the end. I just wanted you to know that I could read that. And most importantly, Section 5. The Section 5 provision of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was pathbreaking. Under Section 5, Congress decided that it was appropriate to try to see if more efficient decision-making could occur with regards to voting and voting rights, more efficient decision-making could occur on the basis of bypassing the federal courts and requiring states that were covered under a particular Section 4 coverage formula of Section 5, a trigger formula based upon voter turnout and low voter turnout or low voter registration under 50% of the otherwise qualified voters who elected, who voted in the election of 1964. And if you were, if you had low participation rates, then you had to, you were covered under Section 5. And Section 5 required you to submit any changes in voting. New precinct lines, new um, geographical lines, changes in the time that the polls were open, changes in the time that um, voter registration offices were open, changes in the number of offices, new districts drawn as a result of a new census. All of those changes had to be sent to the Attorney General for approval. Or at least the Attorney General had 60 days with an automatic 30-day extension to object to these changes as being potentially discriminatory. And this was designed, you could also make your appeal to not appeal, but make your initial request as a jurisdiction that was required to submit these changes. You could also make your, um, your um, submission subject to review of a three-judge special panel of the DC court. And sometimes that happened as well. But generally, it was the Attorney General's office. And this was designed to bypass the federal courts in the South. Be because when many voting rights-related cases had been taken to federal courts in the South, judges legitimately um, nominated, judges legitimately uh, selected by, um, uh, voted on by the Senate. Many of these cases took very long to get through, and most often the decisions, because these were, if you'll permit me, Southern judges, sympathetic largely to the politics of the South, especially the racial politics of the South, these judges tended to decide in favor of the existing state or local government and not in favor of the plaintiffs who are trying to expand their voting rights. Section 5 uh, was the one where the Attorney General came in with targeted enforcement, and the initial states that were covered, not surprisingly, were Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, Virginia, 39 counties in North Carolina, one county in Arizona, and the uh, area of Honolulu. Uh, the city of Honolulu, it's not a county, it's just an area. It is a city, but an, an, uh, an area there. Those were the places that had to submit their changes under Section 5. Not surprisingly, this legislation early on, it's passed in 65, not surprisingly, the legislation was challenged in the case of South Carolina versus Katzenbach because states were the ones who historically had set voting standards. Federal government didn't do that. States did that. Well, of course, they did it with regards to access for women um, in the um, early 1900s, but generally it was states who did that, and here the federal government was imposing itself, I guess I should go like this, imposing itself on the uh, states, setting up these new standards. And the Supreme Court in, oops, sorry, the Supreme Court, in its opinion regarding South Carolina versus Katzenbach, Katzenbach was the Attorney General, decided that all that Congress was doing in passing the Voting Rights Act was exercising the power it was given under the 15th Amendment, that Civil War Amendment related to voting, because Section 2 of the 15th Amendment said if uh, Congress has the power to pass any subsequent legislation uh, consistent with what is stated in Section 1. So all that Congress was doing was just exercising the power that it had given itself in 1870, okay? This is a, a copy of what the language is. I don't have a chance to talk about that. In Section 2, one provision here in Section 5. And the Section 5 provision was so significant, just, not just because it changed, if you will, the power relations between the federal government and state and local governments, but Section 5 covered any qualification prerequisite, standard, practice, or procedure uh, 
that might affect voting, just like I described before. Okay, it was also challenged under Allen versus State Board of Elections in 1969, cases from the states of Virginia and the state of Mississippi. And here the issue was, well, although we understand that we cannot prevent someone from voting, can we still institute practices of vote dilution? And is vote dilution covered under the 1965 Voting Rights Act? And the court in 1969 said yes. And it said yes because it interpreted the law, the 65 Voting Rights Act and um, Section 1 of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. It interpreted it as saying that it would cover dilutionary practices, those that are designed to still allow people to vote but not have a chance of actually winning the election, that um, through um, mechanisms like Mississippi and Virginia had imposed, such as the ones I described, uh, gerrymandering, changing elections from district to at large, um, making uh, positions appointed rather than, rather than elected, they said, no, Congress didn't intend for that to happen either. And in fact, if, I'll get to 75 here in just a minute, and in fact, if, if, Congress didn't intend for dilution to be included, then it would have been a stupid law to pass in the first place. It would have been a law with no power. They didn't use the word stupid. They may have used it in their debate in the Supreme Court. But it wouldn't have made sense to try to protect voting rights because dilution can be just as discriminatory as anything else. Now, the Section 5 preclearance provision um, was renewed, for, was established for five years, renewed in 1970, then in 1975 that we're talking, that we're going to talk about, then in 82 and most recently in 2006. And what I want you to remember from these two examples is the necessity, the critical necessity of federal government action, national government action, using its authority, using its power under the law to work toward getting voting rights extended, the critical necessity of federal government action if states were going to change their practices and procedures. Now, let's get to 1975. Really interesting and the basis for a book that I'm working on. And that Mr. Mullen was just brilliant in telling me these magnificent stories about Southern legislators and so forth. In 1975, when Section 5 was gonna come up for renewal again, in 1975, what happened was toward the end of the hearings where it had been agreed upon by leaders of African, African American civil rights groups and leaders in the Justice Department of the Ford administration, an agreement had been reached. And the agreement was, if you don't extend Section 5 to any other places, then we'll support keeping Section 5 where its current coverage is. We'll update the turnout data to turnout data based upon the 1972 uh, presidential election. But other than that, it'll, and, and when you do that, the areas would remain basically the same. Those seven states, if you will, of the old Confederacy. Late in the game in 1975, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, who had first established an office in Washington, D.C. in 1974, came in and said, we want to be included too. We want to be included under Section 5 protection. And we believe that Mexican Americans and other language minorities, I'll tell you what language minorities referred to here in just a minute, we want to be included too under those special protections because we feel that we have been discriminated against in access to voting and the primary access to registration and voting, and the primary basis of that is language. Sizable percentages of our citizen population, remember this is just referring to citizens, only citizens can vote, sizable percentages of our citizen population don't speak English well enough to be able to understand the political process and when jurisdictions have had elections only in English, it has served effectively, has served effectively like a literacy test that was imposed upon African Americans. So the English only tradition of the United States to only have registration materials and if you're from California, these beautifully complex propositions that get written um, and other uh, bases for the election, 
Um, when they're only in English, it in effect disenfranchises, by law, in effect disenfranchises this segment of the population. And these populations have suffered varieties of voting rights discrimination as well. Gerrymandering, at-large elections, vote polarization, even intimidation. Voting intimidation have been experienced by them as well. So when you combine these voter intimidation and vote dilution efforts with the lack of language, then you can see that this group has been discriminated against as well. Well, that was a bit controversial. And the idea behind this came from a gentleman who I found and interviewed named Al Bettis, who had just, he was from Brownsville, Texas, who had just joined, actually agreed to head the offices of the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund in Washington, D.C. that had first been opened in 1974. And he told me the story when I interviewed him, still around, that he remembered why his parents didn't register and vote in South Texas, although they were second generation US born Americans. And he said the reason was because they didn't speak English well enough. And all of the materials were in English. And they didn't feel that they had the knowledge or had the capacity or the assistance to be able to participate effectively in the political process. Now, um, with some, I don't have time to go into this, but with some, um, how shall I call it, lobbying of the leadership of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, it started to take it on, it decided to take this issue on. Well, Al Perez was just out of law school. He went to George Washington Law School on scholarship. And he was an Air Force veteran. And um, he um, had clerked, uh, or had in a, um, a summer clerkship, if you will, with a law firm of Hogan and Hartson in Washington, D.C. And there, the head of the pro bono division was a gentleman by the name of um, da David Tatel, right? David Tatel, who was an attorney there, a partner, head of their pro bono division. As you may know, a Judge Tatel subsequently became a, uh, a judge in the D.C. Circuit Court. And I believe it was since he was 30 years old, he was blind. And he used to handle all of his legal cases and his legal reading and his legal reasoning and his legal writing and so forth, you know, with assistance of others and with Braille and a variety of, of things. And at the time he was here, he was already going blind. And the newest hired assistant, someone else I interviewed, someone, uh, someone who's become a friend of mine, Thomas Reston. Thomas Reston was a young associate in the firm of Vogan and Hartson. He was from Virginia had never seen a language minority, um, had never worked with Latino communities, but as the young associate assigned to Tatel, Tatel said, you're going to handle this for us. You're going to be the person in charge of it. And Tom, who's a lovely man, who subsequently became uh, president of the board of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, Tom said, okay, let's go for it. So with the assistance of Hogan and Hartson, David Tatel and Reston there, the support of the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund, Al Perez felt pretty good that they were going to have a shot of doing something that they wanted to do. But of course, as it turns out, their primary goal was to get Texas covered under the Voting Rights Act because Texas wasn't covered under the initial act, despite Texas, my home state, having a long history of voting discrimination and intimidation against both African Americans and Mexican Americans. But they didn't have a literacy test. And that's the reason they weren't included on the original 1965 legislation. So this was a way to get Texas covered and other areas. So they came up with a term, and I think this was David Tatel, I should say, oh, this is being recorded, uh, so I won't say it, but anyway, it hasn't been easy to get in touch with, um, with Judge Tatel. How's that? That's pretty good, that's pretty soft. He refuses to speak to me, I'll say it anyway, uh, by uh, setting it up that way. Um, and there's a reason for that, which is very interesting. They, they, he, I am told, he hasn't told me this because he won't talk to me, but he, he, he um, I was told, he came up with the idea of language minorities. And this was based upon a census category. That is, the census in 1970, remember we're talking here about 1975, had a category for people 
the number of people in census tracts and census blocks and counties and cities and states whose primary language was other than English. And then you try to separate out the citizens from that group and the argument was these citizens are being denied their rights because uh, elections are being held only in English. After a tremendous effort to find evidence on the basis of the language discrimination and general voting rights discrimination done primarily by George Corbel, who is from Minnesota, had worked for the Mexican American Legal Defense Education for, for, for a while and was now an attorney with VISTA and assigned to work there. And Patricia Villarreal, who was, oh, I'm forgetting his name, uh, Don Edwards, uh, House uh, member Don Edwards was on his staff. She together worked in the House to gather the evidence that was necessary. So the point I want to make here is there was a value of using a new and perhaps ambiguous category of language minorities that combined elements of language, race, and voting discrimination to see whether or not you could get Latinos covered or other groups, Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, get them covered through these provisions of the law as well. Now there's a critical role played by the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. This was a group largely dominated by African Americans of civil rights leaders in Washington, D.C. who said, we don't want any part of this. And the reason was because they had already negotiated, I know my time is getting short, but I, I usually go over five minutes anyway. Um, you're supposed to laugh at that too, but this is, this is a tough crowd. Um, <laughs> mainly because they're members here of the Advisory Council to the Institute for Latino Studies. That's a joke. Um, they're, they're, yeah, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> since we're on tape, I have to say that's a joke. Um, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights said, no way! We already negotiated with the Ford administration. And the Ford administration said, if you, pre if you agree that there will be no expansion, no expansion in who is covered under Section 5, we'll sign it for renewal. We'll cut it back from the original recommendation of 10 years to 7 years, as, as Mr. Mullen helped me understand, um, but we're not going to support this. So there was this process of negotiation, critical process of negotiation that occurred. Uh, negotiation among members of Congress, Senator Philip Hart, who Mr. Mullen worked for, uh, Edward Roybal, uh, Herman Badillo of California, Don Edwards of uh, California, but two critical players in the House were Andrew Young and Barbara Jordan. Now, the, the, the arguments in the Senate, again, as Mr. Mullen helped me understand <laughs> yesterday, were largely related to efforts by Southern senators to use parliamentary procedures to try to get rid of Section 5 overall and wait until the deadline would pass and had a variety of, and uh, talked to Mr. Mullen, he has a, these fascinating stories, just absolutely politically fascinating stories about how that worked. But members of Congress, Andrew Young, Democrat from Georgia, and especially Barbara Jordan, Democrat from Texas, said that English-only election worked as an effective test or device, like literacy tests, to be able to um, prevent blacks from voting. Barbara Jordan, as some of you may remember her from the uh, Nixon Commission and hearings, was a, you know, a very, had a tremendous presence, I'll say. I know, my time's getting close, so you can ask some questions. Um, and she said, my district, I should have brought the quote, but I didn't. My district has sizable numbers of both Mexican Americans and African Americans. So I know from my district that both Mexican Americans and African Americans have faced voting discrimination. So she could make that claim. And she brought, I think, members of the Black Congressional Caucus, members of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, to ultimately support the expansion of the Voting Rights Act to these new areas covering language minorities in the 1975 renewal of Section 5. And when in the Senate, people like Senator Philip Hart and our own Mike Mullen here, um, working as a staff member uh, for Senator Hart at the time, uh, worked very hard to put together the 
political will and the civic will to be able to uh, get this legislation passed. And ultimately, it was passed by 341 to 70 in the House and 77 to 12 in the Senate. So what this demonstrates to us, and the title of the book on the 75 Voting Rights Act, the tentative title right now is America at its Best, the 1975 Voting Rights Act, showed that you can have a triumph of political will when you identify and pursue a convergence of interests that cross color lines, that cross class lines, that cross geographical lines, when members of Congress decide that this is what is in the best interests of the country. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that we can all agree as to what the best interests of the country are, but in this case in 1975, it was clear that different groups who at times competed with each other, except for those in the South, representing the South, came to understand that this expansion of the Voting Rights Act to include more groups and maintain their coverage of African Americans in Southern states was in the best interest of growing democracy in the country. So what I want to leave you with as a final um, thought, given our time constraints, I want to talk to you about all these things that you might want to know. What I want to leave you with is just one other set of empirical facts and then um, a final conclusion. As between January 1 and May 14, at least 14 states enacted 22 new laws that restrict access to the vote. 61 bills with restrictive provisions are moving through 18 state legislatures right now, and overall, 389 restrictive bills in 48 states in the 2021 legislative election were considered. Now, how could that happen? Given the 65 Voting Rights Act, given the 75 extension of the Voting Rights Act, given the nature of the debates, given the renewals that occurred of Section 5 in 1982 and 2006, how is that possible? It happened because of a Supreme Court decision. A Supreme Court decision in the case of, of um, Shelby versus Holder. Shelby, Shelby County in the state of Alabama that claimed that the Section 5 preclearance coverage was unconstitutional. Well, that had already been decided earlier, but a new Supreme Court in 2013 with more appointees appointed by Republican presidents, um, Reagan, George Herbert Walker Bush, George Bush, and um, um, well, Donald Trump wasn't there yet, he would come, come in later, became a new majority under the leadership of the Chief Justice, a classmate of mine in college, John Roberts. Uh, we didn't know each other, we traveled in different circles, but he was in the uh, fall class of, uh, of 1973 at Harvard, and um, um, John Roberts went to Harvard Law School, and John Roberts had worked in the Reagan Justice Department and written some memos about the evils of the um, Voting Rights Act and so forth, and why Section 5 coverage was inappropriate. He wrote a majority opinion that said that Section 5, based upon this old Section 4 about turnout in the 1974 election, didn't apply anymore. The racial divisions that occurred in 1974 don't exist today anymore. And he also argued that there is a principle of law of equal sovereignty among the states. Now, this principle of equal sovereignty, to find this principle of equal sovereignty, he had to find a case from the 1850s pre-Civil War, where the discussion was about what was needed for states to become, what was needed for territories to become states, and that you had to treat these territories equally. You couldn't treat them differentially in their qualifications to consider applying uh, to become states of the United States. So he threw out Section 4 and that decision, which in effect made Section 5 not relevant anymore. As soon as that happened, you begin to get these states and others, these states begin to impose changes in their law, significant changes in their law, like restricting voting, like restricting, um, not restricting voting, excuse me, uh, um, having IDs, voter ID legislation, restricting how many hours registration areas are open, restricting how many ballot drop boxes you could have 
in particular areas, restricting male voting, not M-A-L-E, but M-A-I-L, restricting male voting, and a variety of other mechanisms that were clearly dilutionary slash disenfranchising. And they felt comfortable doing that because of the Supreme Court opinion. Now, there were other states that were simultaneously passing laws to make voting easier. Same-day voter registration, um, voter registration um, for high school students so that when they became 18, they would be eligible to vote, and other ways of trying to facilitate the process in states like these, but it was these states who were the ones that were setting new precedents for trying to restrict voting rights for both African Americans, language minorities, and other groups in the United States. So here you have, if you will, history repeating itself. And what's important to understand when you look at voting rights, I'll stop, I promise, in just a few minutes. What's, what, if you, if you believe that, you know, I have some um, a beach property in, in Arizona uh, for you to consider buying. Um, that's a, come on, that's trying to be a joke, okay? Um, although not a good one. If you remove that Section 5 coverage, these states took immediate action. So what you see from that is, Progress on voting rights always leaves resentment. So that the progress is not unidirectional. The progress is more like a pendulum, where you get progress sometimes, and then you get retrenchment as soon as the law allows you to retrench. The law as defined by the Supreme Court or the Congress, and in this case, it was the Supreme Court. If you will, it allows you to understand that progress can lead to opposition. But you need to do it under the cover, if not the letter, of the law. So this idea that federal intervention is necessary is very clear to me, but federal intervention to allow for more discrimination is evident as well. Final, final point, final, final slide. So what is this, what do we learn from all of this? What is the significance of all of this? I don't have time to go through these slides with you, although they're really kind of cool, and I'm happy to send them to you if you'd like them. I'll leave you with this following quote from a book that I, that I like. This is a book by uh, Roberto Mangabeira Unger, a legal theorist, and Cornell West, a religious studies scholar and, and professor of African American studies. They wrote in a book called American Progressivism the following. To understand your country, you must love it. To love it, you must, in a sense, accept it. To accept it as it is, however, is to betray it. Think about that. To accept it as it is, however, is to betray it. To accept your country without betraying it, you must love it for that in it which shows what it might become. The way I read that particular quote with regards to voting rights is as follows. We have always struggled with expanding voting rights to more segments of our population, but the fight, if you will, is worth it, even when there's retrenchment, when you can put together the necessary coalitions and political will to try to institutionalize, make permanent, and legalize, if you will, that expansion in voting rights and protection in voting rights, but it is a never-ending effort. You can't just do it once. You have to continue, continue, and continue to do it because otherwise the retrenchment will occur. Political will and the convergence of interests. One of the main tenets of the Congregation of Holy Cross, some of you have heard me say this before, is the belief in divine providence, the belief that God has a plan. I love that about the tenets of the Congregation of Holy Cross that we're, that we're all part of, we're all part of the family of. I understand this political moment and these last few years of our political moment as being part of God's plan. God is testing us to see whether or not we're up to the challenge to expand fairness, to expand equality, to expand justice to more segments of our population and others than ever before. Maybe, maybe, maybe we who are in, I look at this room, 
but relatively few students, maybe none, we in positions of leadership now are the ones who are going to make decisions that will determine what legacy we leave our children and our grandchildren. And as our country becomes more multicultural, more different than the populations that we were raised in, that we grew up in, I'm 66 years old, when we, if we're in a position now to decide what kind of a legacy we want to leave to our children, and especially for those of us who are fortunate enough to have them, I have two, um, our grandchildren. And whether or not we're going to leave them with a country and a commitment to voting and democracy and voting rights, that we would be proud to leave them, or whether we're going to leave them with more conflict and divisiveness than ever before. Think of it this way. Can we regain the confidence that we had in 65 and 75 to do what is right, to renew and expand democracy in the US once again? I pray that we can, and I want to live yet again in an America at its best. Thank you. My time is perfectly right. There's absolutely no time for questions. Um, just joking. Do you have any questions, comments, criticisms that you'd like to make? If I come close to you, it's just because I have hearing aids and I need to hear you more clearly. So speak your questions loudly. If you're comfortable, pull your mask down when you ask the question, then put your mask back up. Thoughts, questions, ideas? Yes. Um, how might Section 5 of the Civil Rights Act be reinstated? And I guess relatedly, is there a legal precedent to limit the term of a Supreme Court judge in order to sort of quicken the pace of the people when you refer to? No, not so far. But the rule is Congress sets the rules regarding the terms of the Supreme Court. So by congressional legislation, it would be very difficult to do now. But Congress is the one that sets the rules for determining whether or not you know, what the terms will be, what the size of the court will be, uh, things of that sort. So it, it could be changed, but it wouldn't be easy. It wouldn't be, in my opinion, it wouldn't be easy at all to do. And because of the unknown of what that would mean and the unknown of what the impact would be of that occurring. Yeah. There's some people who say that. Well, uh, for example, st state judges, are they appointed or elected? State Supreme Court and you know, State Superior Court and State District Court judges. Well, usually they're appointed initially by the governor or nominated in the Senate of and then they run for re-election. Right? So there's a, there's a popular vote component to their serving in their term. Has that led to the downfall of democracy? Well, depending on the state you're in and what your political preferences are, you might think that's the case and one could see how it could work out that way when there are significant majorities and minorities that always conflict with each other and one group doesn't win. Is that any worse than being in a state where someone is serving for their entire life, right, or in, a, in the nation, where a judge is serving their entire life when you have significant disagreements with the majority vote on the court? That Shelby versus, Shelby, Shelby versus Holder decision was at that time uh, five to four. One vote. One vote affecting all parts of the, of the country at one way because it sends a signal and certainly those areas of the country that were covered under Section 5, which we know are the sections of the country that have had the longest history and current practices of vote, both voter disenfranchisement and uh, vote dilution. Another question. Yes, please. Well, I, I certainly agree and, and very sympathetic to this, but, you know, uh, our voting system is much less restricted than in certainly European countries, which I'm familiar with, where you have to physically show up unless you can demonstrate the need for an absentee ballot. Um, and people have a much greater sense of responsibility to vote than what we have here. Yeah, yeah. So how do we change that? Um, I have a solution that no person in Congress or the Senate has found very exciting um, to do that. How do we get more people to participate? Um, we are the only, I believe, the only democracy 
advanced industrial, post-industrial democracy in the world, where the government does not take the responsibility for registering us to vote. In all other democratic countries, is a government agency that goes out and says, you know, Mr. Mullen, you can, you can, you can, right? You, you're qualified to register to vote. This is your address. This is where you're going to vote. Now, why would, a, why would a government do that? Why would it give everybody the chance to be registered to vote? Because it's a democracy. Because it should be influenced by the voices of the people. We've always done it differently. It's not an opt-out system where you don't have to vote, although there are some countries that have mandatory voting. Belgium and Australia come to mind as having mandatory voting. You're fined if you don't vote. Relatively small amount of money, but you're still fine. We have an opt-in system, and we make it pretty easy. But when you look at all the data, who are the folks who tend not to register to vote? Lesser educated, lower income, and to the extent that that intersects with race and ethnicity, those are the folks that we know are excluded. Okay? So the concern about and why you have these efforts at voter ID and so forth is that if you allow certain segments of the population, citizen population, if you give, make it easier for them to register or easier for them to vote, you're going to be at a partisan disadvantage. And my solution is give everybody a national ID card. If you have a national ID card, which most democratic countries have, just a card that says, I'm an American citizen, and we've checked your documents and so forth, and they say that you're an American citizen, right? And we register you to vote at the same time because you're an American citizen above the age of 18. That you could immediately register those 75 percent, excuse me, 25 percent of whites who are citizens who are not registered to vote. Those 30, 35 percent of African Americans who are otherwise qualified to vote, to register and vote, and not register to vote. And those 48 to 50 percent of Latinos and Asians who are other citizens, otherwise qualified to vote, but not registered to vote. And we would have an ID card that would facilitate protecting employers should they hire, and this is where my immigration friends, you know, beat me up, right? Have a way to protect employers to make sure that they're hiring people who are here with proper documents. Because that ID card would say you're, you're a citizen, you're a legal permanent resident, uh, you're a DACA recipient with the capacity to legally vote, you're not, you're undocumented, it's been forged, or you know, whatever it is that, that might be the case. I think it's time for us to be more inclusive, to sacrifice a little bit of our individual liberty. But I, but I have a hard time thinking on the liberty issue that if the government wants to find us, it, it, it probably can probably knows where we live. It probably knows through our tax records, through our education records, through our public health records or whatever, right? So the liberty we're actually giving up is very important in principle to some folks, but I don't think it's that important in practicality. And to be able to grow democracy, grow democracy at a time when our country is going through such significant demographic shift, I think it's worth, in my opinion, it's worth the price. And it's a tragedy that we can't do that. In fact, there are data that show that as our country has become more diverse, particularly with more Latinos and more Asian Americans, the gap between their participation of citizens, the gap between their participation and the participation of African Americans, it's roughly consistent with their percent of the qualified population and with whites, has grown as well. So, fewer, a smaller percentage of Latino citizens and Asian American citizens are voting as they become larger segments of our population. That's a recipe for disaster, democratic disaster. And one of the greatest innovations that our nation brought to the world was with all of our problems and all of our challenges and much of what I talked about here with you this afternoon, many, um, we've still made some progress with that threat. If you did something like I'm suggesting, the threat is removed. And the government takes the responsibility for keeping things accurate. And we might have to invest in 
a new computer system and new security system and you know, a variety of other things because of the sort of um, security breaches that we have and so forth. But I think it's worth, worth the effort and worth the price to have more people per having the chance to participate in our system than we've ever had in our history. And well, I, you can go to the 1880s, 1890s, we had 90% participation rates. But no women could vote. Um, black or white, um, and there were tremendous differences by property ownership as well, even though you didn't have to own property. Uh, but otherwise qualified people were voting in large numbers. Uh, that hasn't been the case in the post-World War II era, and it gets worse every year. Questions? Other questions? Yes, Gregory. What do you think of the concept of weekend or evening voting? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, most other, most other democratic countries um, declare voting a holiday, a paid holiday, whether on the weekend, a Saturday, or a day of the week. Why? So people can vote. <laughs> and so it's easier for people to vote. Do we do that? Our only example of that, interestingly enough, is the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. And there, their voter on the island, not Puerto Ricans once they migrate to the United States, uh, Puerto Ricans are American citizens, they're on the island, their participation rates are 80 to 90% consistently. There may be other reasons too, but that's among the reasons that they're there. Um, weekend voting, it seems to me, makes sense. You know, all these things have to be appropriately monitored. Mail voting makes sense. I did that in the state of Washington when I lived there. Very easy, very convenient, except when the state uh, forgot to tell us that we had to actually buy the postage and put it on the ballots in, uh, if you did not take it to a drop box. Issues today are um, how many drop boxes you have. And uh, we fought, I was chair of a, of a commission for the mayor of Seattle trying to increase the participation of citizen refugees and immigrants. And we found that there were fewer drop boxes for the mail ballots in Washington, all voting is by mail, in immigrant, refugee, lower income areas. And they said, well, that's because fewer people vote. And I said, well, yeah, but the reason fewer people vote is because there are fewer drop boxes and it's more difficult for them to get to where they need to get to be able to vote. So there's a way that we could try to standardize that. You can have same day voter registration. Some places are doing that. It's a provisional vote and you have to show the justification or the evidence for you to be qualified to vote subsequently, right? But that, that kind of makes sense as well. Anyone else? I know we're going over time, but I love talking about this stuff. Yeah, say it loudly, please. Professor, given the high hurdle uh, these days to get around the filibuster, yeah. what do you think the chances are or what could be done? Uh, in your yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a tough one. Um, that's, for me, that's a very, very tough one uh, because whatever your political preference is, you know, whatever your ideology, whatever your partisan identification, sometimes you love the filibuster and sometimes you hate it. And, and, and right now, it seems that the Democrats are the ones who hate the filibuster. But I could see a situation where, um, where Republicans would hate the filibuster in other circumstances where the Democrats are able to be just enough to prevent that, that legislation from being passed. I think we're gonna have to get rid of it at some point. And remember, among the most effective uses of the filibuster uh, in the history of the filibuster in the United States was by Southern members of the House and senators to use it as a way to prevent civil rights legislation from being passed. And as Mr. Mullen helped me understand, you do have members of the House and especially of the Senate who are master parliamentarians um, who can manipulate things in terms of the formal rules that exist in the House and in the Senate, the formal rules that exist to allow you to you know, gauge whether you want to impose it or not and things of that sort. Um, I think it's, it's unfortunate when whatever you're, well, that's not fair. I think it's unfortunate when a group consistently uses the threat of, filibuster, of the filibuster to help move the country forward in some ways that significant numbers of legislative leaders want to do. Again, that's an ideological question and a normative question in addition to a partisan question. Um, it's both. 
So I don't see it as being easy to change. That, that's, that's the hesitation of, of uh, President Biden and Nancy Pelosi and others. You know, Nancy Pelosi is in the House, she's not in the Senate, but of Chuck Schumer in the Senate to, to completely endorse getting rid of the filibuster. They know the partisan numbers could shift and then they're in a really tough position. That's not really an answer, but that's what I think at this point. Any other questions? Thank you so much for the chance to speak with you. Um, as director of the Institute for Latino Studies, I'm obligated to say that you can always contribute to the Institute for Latino Studies on, on ND Day or any other day of the week, or if you have any questions that we can help with. We have 33 affiliated faculty fellows who do work on issues related to what I call the future of the country and the future of the Catholic Church. Uh, just because of the demographic numbers, right? Just where the numbers are and where they're going. And that's what we do there at the Institute with our 33 affiliated faculty members and grad students and undergrad students and 44 classes that we offer and so forth, right? So um, if there's any way we can help, shoot me an email and I'm very happy to help in any way that I can. Okay, thank you. Take care. Have a good afternoon.